Okay. And start right there. Okay. It just kept saying waiting for host to start. Um, I start and I stopped and started again. So okay. I did that. Hi, I'm Barb Hardy. Uh, I am a nurse practitioner at the University of North Texas Health Science Center here in Fort Worth. Um, I work with a group of docs. They're all board certified uh, geriatric physicians and any doctor can say he's a gerontologist. Um, our docs go through a two year fellowship program and they sit for national boards, which I think they have to do every five years or something like that. So anyway, so uh, my main focus where they have me is dementia. Uh, I work here at James L. West, see everybody here, and then uh, also at other facilities, uh, assisted livings, memory care centers. Uh, actually been here going on 25 years now. Um, I was here, what, 20, we opened 28 years? 28. Mm -hmm. Okay, I was here just a couple of years after they opened. So um, what I was asked to speak about today, and if you have any, can they ask questions or chat yeah, in? Um, they're gonna ask questions at the end. At the end, ask questions at the end, okay. So what we're gonna do is talk about Alzheimer's disease, chronic conditions, a little bit of a focus on depression. So uh, we'll get started. Did I do it right? Uh, nope. So do I just hit that one maybe? You can do that. Okay, okay. So um, basically um, what is um, Alzheimer's dementia. So let me say this first, because uh, people get it confused. They say my loved one has dementia, but not Alzheimer's, or they have Alzheimer's, but not dementia. So think of dementia as a big umbrella. And underneath that umbrella are the different types of dementia. And there's a lot of different types of dementia. The most common cause is Alzheimer's. And when you hear someone say Alzheimer's dementia, what that is saying are those thick, abnormal plaques and tangles within the brain. So you have millions of neurons talking to each other. Say, Barb, lift your hand. Barb, this is how you drive a car. Barb, you got to get up and go to work today. Everything you do is these neurons talking to each other. So what happens with dementia, the Alzheimer's type, um, a thick plaque comes in between those neurons so they can't communicate. Now, that's one reason we can stage it because uh, you start out with just a few of these plaques and tangles. And then as the disease progresses, pretty soon your brain is just riddled, okay? So, so dementia, the Alzheimer's type, is the plaques and tangles. And you're here about that. There's no real way to diagnose it yet. Uh, there are now specialized scans that can see how much amyloid you have in your brain. But we don't know if that's the cause of the disease or what happens after you get the disease. So there's still a lot of research going on. I'm also a clinical research coordinator. So for new drugs for dementia, I'm the one in charge of all the FDA regulations, recruiting people in. Uh, we've done IV infusions with some of the MAB drugs, bapinuzumab, cronazumab. So we're doing a lot of research, but at this point in time throughout the world, it's not just a disease in the United States. This disease is throughout the world. Your biggest risk factor is age. We're looking at environmental causes. We're looking at genetics. Uh, but so far, it seems your biggest risk factor is age, and then we're looking at other risk factors. So that's dementia, the Alzheimer's type. Think plaque, plaques and tangles within the brain that's causing interruptions, and they get worse and worse as time goes on, and we don't have a way to stop them yet. And that's what some of these IV infusions are looking at. Can we stop them? Can we do a PET scan to see if someone has them, or if you have a genetic prone to it, they're looking at genetics. Should we start this ahead of time so you don't develop the plaques and tangles? Um, again, but we're not sure if that's the reason you have the disease. So lots of questions. So Alzheimer's, dementia, plaques and tangles. Then you have vascular dementia. I talk fast, so I'll <laughs> write your questions down. Vascular dementia are those people that have vascular risk factors like high blood pressure, diabetes, high, uh, high cholesterol. Anything that affects the vessels in the body affects the vessels in the brain. Everything is connected. It's like big roadways and highways. So what's good for the heart is good for the brain and vice versa. So we can control that to some extent, you know, keeping your blood pressure under control. If you're diabetic, keeping that under control. Because the vascular disease is when you're having these little strokes or TIAs, transient ischemic attacks, or a big stroke. 
okay? The smaller ones can be silent. Your loved one may not show any signs or symptoms. They may not have a facial group. They may not slur their speech. They may not be weak on one side, but they can have silent ones. And unfortunately, these accumulate. And as they accumulate, you have more damage to the brain. There's dementia of the Lewy body, abnormal proteins in the front of the brain. There's uh, uh, dementia from traumatic brain injuries, lots of different types of dementia. The main ones y'all hear about will be Alzheimer's, vascular, and probably Lewy body. But there's a lot. And just because you have one doesn't mean you can't have the other. So if someone comes to our clinic and they have uh, a lot of vascular risk factors, but the disease has been coming on very slowly, it might be a mixed dementia. It might be Alzheimer's and vascular if they have vascular risk factors. We say Alzheimer's is a slow, gradual decline. Vascular dementia, you go along, you take a hit to the brain, you decline. And you don't get quite back to where you were. Go along, another hit to the, so it's stepwise, okay? Um, but there can be mixed dementia. So again, a progressive neurological disorder that causes the brain to atrophy and brain cells to die. So if you look at the brain of someone who died of dementia of the Alzheimer's type and someone who died of any other disease, the Alzheimer's brain is going to be shrunken. It's going to be smaller because of so much neuronal death. You can see the changes that it's affected. Um, so uh, Alzheimer's is the most common cause of dementia, even though I think vascular is probably catching up. Um, and it is a continuous decline in thinking, behavioral, and social skills that affects a person's ability to function independently. And you all know this. I'm telling you things you know. But again, um, you know, you have the cognitive dis decline. You may have uh, behavioral, social skills. You take dad to the restaurant and he slaps the waitress on the, on the bottom. You know, dad would never do that. But now he's doing weird things. He forgets how to use a knife and a fork. For and this is where your depression can come in because the person knows something's not right and they become depressed. They may become withdrawn. They may not want to go to social gatherings, a birthday party for a grandchild. They're afraid they do something wrong. They're losing words. They start describing items because they can't think of the word for it. So again, what you're seeing is um, uh, the, the decline in thinking, behavioral and social skills. So eventually they cannot function independently. In the early stages, they may still be working. They may still be fine. They just may need a few cues. But as the disease progresses and more and more damage is done to the brain, um, they're going to need more help. They may put on two sets of clothes. They may uh, think they've already eaten when they haven't eaten or vice versa. I see it all. I haven't had lunch. Well, you know, she just had lunch. You're not going to argue with her, but she doesn't remember. Okay. Okay. So um, again, and this affects depression also, the withdrawing, which is really bad because you wanna keep them as functionally active and socially active as you can. Um, Six million in the US live with AD, I think it's more than that now. Of these 80% are 75 years and older. But, um, and Holly can attest to this, we're seeing younger people now. Uh, we're seeing people in their 60s more. Um, there is, I think it's like 5% of people may have the familial uh, Alzheimer's. And these are families that almost all of them are going to get it. I think there's one in Italy. There's one somewhere that they're really studying, but mostly what we see, not sometimes a lot of risk factors, they just get it. We know it's not purely genetic because identical twins don't always both get it. Okay. So we know that there's more to it than that. We just not sure what. Um, so it is a disease of the aging brain. And you know, if you look at depression as someone ages, they start to have more losses, maybe a spouse, maybe their home, you know, their friends are dying off. So you have depression on top of the dementia. And there's some studies going on saying that uh, deep seated depression can cause dementia. We're looking at that. So recognizing dementia in the older adult, our clinic really looks at that. We do de depression skills. We tell the people to be honest, like, have you lost interest in doing things you used to do? Uh, do you often feel sad? Do you not want to go out anymore? So we are constantly looking at depression because depression can be treated either with psychotherapy or with medications. So we want to get them through that the best we can. Um, again, like I said, there's no treatment that cure, cures or alters disease process in the brain of someone with Alzheimer's. 
Now, we are, research is going on all over the world. Some of these countries like Japan has a really rapidly aging population. Um, a, lot of, a lot of places do have uh, aging people. So they're really stuck. India, I have had uh, interns from India with me and they're amazed at James L. West. They say, we don't have places like this in India. The children are expected to stay home and take care of the older adults, but it's not happening now. The children are going off wherever to the city, to America, wherever. So it's a huge problem. Um, I had a group of, of uh, individuals from Japan spend a day with me and they were amazed. And what was so interesting, they said, your people are just like our people wanting to go home. Um, you know, the same agitation, the same restlessness. They said, this is just like what we're seeing with our people in Japan. So they wanted to see how facilities are set up and, and you know, how we're dealing with the disease. So again, it's everywhere in the world. Um, you, if you all have questions on the new drug that's out there at the end, I'll be happy to answer them. We've really looked into this. But at this point, there's no treatment that cures or alters the disease process in the brain with someone with um, Alzheimer's. What we're trying to do is figure out what triggers those plaques and tangles, if the plaques and tangles are actually the reason for the disease, the cause of the disease, or just an effect of the disease. So a lot going on in research, okay? Keeping the mind active, we know helps. You can compensate longer, uh, learning a new language, even brushing your hair with your left hand, using your left hand if you're right-handed. Building as many pathways as you can in the brain is what we're looking at. This one here. Okay, okay, so. Acute and chronic coexisting conditions. Unfortunately, we get people, all of us too, you don't just get out of this life with one disease. Lots of times there's several diseases. So if you look at acute versus chronic. So when we say acute, it's something that comes on fast, unexpected, um, like a cold, like other things, chest pain that comes on fast, lung infections, they're calling me and say, Barb, so-and-so is coughing, they have a disease, uh, uh, their lungs are decreased, their uh, temperature, I mean, um, cellulitis, they've scratched their leg and now it's, it's all red and hot and swollen. Falls with lacerations uh, and new agitated behaviors. These are acute conditions. And we're trying to figure out for some of these, especially a new agitated behavior, what's going on. Are they in pain? That's one of my big concerns at all times. Is someone in pain? Are we not recognizing it? Because a lot of our residents here cannot tell us they're in pain. So we look for them frowning. We look for restlessness. We look for them getting up and down. We look for them pushing us away. We look at a lot of things for, for new agitated behaviors. Change in environment, you know, what's going on. So those are your acute conditions. And usually um, our group will order lab. We'll really try to figure out what's going on. Uh, x-rays, whatever we need to do to kind of figure out what's going on and acute conditions you can sometimes fix. Um, so that's our goal there. Chronic conditions you can't fix, they're chronic. Uh, coronary artery disease, COPD, which is co chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, your bronchitis, your asthma, um, uh, arthritis, osteoporosis. So you can see these chronic kidney disease, heart failure. And then you have your psychiatric diseases, bipolar, schizophrenia, obsessive compulsive. These are diseases we think of managing. We can't cure them, we manage them. Um, for COPD, do they need to be on oxygen? You know, do they just need an inhaler when they <clears throat> get sick, when they you know, catch a cold? Um, arthritis, I'm a big one because I've got arthritis. Are they in pain? I put a lot of people on time Tylenol because they can't tell me, but I see they have arthritic, arthritic changes in their hands. You know, they've got osteoporosis. They've had compression fractures in the back. They hurt. They need to be on something. Um, our goal is not to sedate them. Our, our goal is to relieve the pain so they become more active, more interested in what's going on around them, and also so they eat better. A lot of different things. If you're in pain, you don't do that. Um, your chronic kidney disease, what medications are they on? You know, how are they excreted from the body? We're trying to keep the, the kidney function, the lab values at, you know, a level we can keep them at. 
Uh, the heart failure, this is a big one. Um, and it's a balancing act. We're constantly, you know, some of these people we weigh every day, every other day, is the weight they're gaining from them eating or is it edema? Is their heart not functioning well and they're, and they're getting edematous, which makes them more short of breath, makes them wheezy, you know, more strain on the heart. The psychiatric ones are, are complex because now besides the behaviors that can be associated with dementia, we have to look at someone say with schizophrenia or bipolar. They're already depressed and they're in the depressive state of bipolar. So now it's even worse. Okay, so what medications are they on? One thing, you know, we try to talk to the families and I'll ask them when we admit someone, you know, uh, did your mom ever have any signs of anything else going on? I've had family members tell me that she used to go away for a week and come back and she was very different. I don't know if they, you know, did the ECT to her head or what, but that disease along, these diseases were, uh, there was a stigma to them. So, and lots of times nobody knew and they start doing things. We have one lady that just was putting toilet tissue down the, the toilet bowl. We have to restrict how much toilet paper she has. Um, we have a gentleman who has to bathe all the time after every urination or bowel movement, which is bad because when we couldn't, not gonna get showered all day long, uh, he tried not to drink water so he wouldn't have to go to the bathroom because he knew he wasn't going to get a complete shower. And that's a problem. Then he becomes dehydrated. So again, there are medications for these and they need to be on them. We don't stop these medications. Um, we'll talk about when to stop medications. Um, but so you're looking at acute versus chronic and, and uh, you the acute you try to fix, the chronic you try to manage. Yeah. Let me try it again. Maybe let me do that one. Okay, so um, as we look at uh, prevention strategies for managing acute conditions, uh, start with depression. It's not on here, but it should be. Uh, you know, um, are they depressed? Why are they depressed? Is it uh, because of the disease state? So what I have to look at is what stage of the disease are they in? If they're in the early stages, they're more prone to be depressed. And then the reason most people end up in a facility is because of incontinence or behaviors, okay? Or the family is just exhausted. You know, in our clinic, we consider the, the family members our patients too. And I don't always say, how's your husband doing? You know, I say, how are you doing? You know, are you managing okay? Do you need a break? And sometimes they just burst into tears and they're like, I'm exhausted. Nobody ever asked about me. They ask about my husband, which I appreciate, but I'm exhausted. So, um, you know, I'm looking for depression in the caregivers and in the family members and, and in the patient. Part of the issue now, because so many daycare centers have closed, which gave in respite areas families a break, we don't have those now because of COVID or not as much. So the families are not getting that break that they need. So, you know, I'm always constantly looking at depression. You know, what can we do? Are they on the right medication? If they've been on it, it's not working. Do I need to change it? Um, you know, is it a pain issue? Why are they depressed? I mean, they have a reason to be depressed. Usually in the later stages, of course, we don't see it as much. There's been so much cellular death. Um, I usually leave them on the antidepressant till they have problems swallowing whatever, just to maybe get them to come out, sit at the table, go to a, a function, whatever, because there's no way for us to know. So I'm doing the best I can to keep them engaged. Um, so for acute cardiac, we talked a little bit about this. You know, I want, always want a baseline EKG. They may come in and the family says, well, you know, dad's been estranged. I don't know if he has cardiac problems. So I want to get a baseline EKG to see, is there really a change? Should I expect there's going to be a change? Has there been a past uh, myocardial infarction? What's going on? Nitroglycerin on hand. Uh, always looking at any recent changes in medications. Could it be stress related? Is it really cardiac? We get a lot of people with um, gastro issues, horrible reflux, and if some of you have had that, esophageal spasm. You think you're dying. It feels like the pressure in the chest, like you're having a heart attack. So for cardiac, since they can't always tell us when they have chest pain, it's up to the staff to, to look, to recognize, are they grimacing? Are they holding here? Are they holding their jaw? You know, what's going on? Um, 
for the lungs, one of the biggest things I've seen is the respiratory rate going up. So if the respiratory rate's going up um, to me and they look okay, but they're breathing faster, I'm like, something's wrong here. Uh, and it's not just in people. We had uh, my, I have horses and at our barn, she rescued a couple of little miniature horses from, from the kill pen. And I went to see them and I'm like, something's wrong with them. Something's wrong with them. Look how they're breathing. And um, they were standing there, but they were breathing too fast. And sure enough, took them both to the vet. They ended up a week there with pneumonia. So respiratory rate, if your loved one's breathing fast or your pets, you know, you need to kind of figure out why. You know, coughing, some people have chronic coughs due to allergies, but if it's a new cough, is it productive? Are they bringing up? Now, just because it's yellow doesn't always mean infection. That can be the eosinophils, different things that are making it colored. But still, you know, usually, uh, especially allergies can sometimes have a color to them. But, you know, are they productive? How long have they been coughing? I'm usually going to get a chest x-ray. I got one on a lady the other day that had fallen and she said it was her ribs, but she was a little confused and she kept going up underneath her breast saying it's where I had shingles. And it kind of went around and I couldn't get a clear answer. But when I listened to her lungs, I didn't like the way they sounded. Um, and even though it was for a fall for her ribs, I got a chest x-ray and sure enough, she's got pneumonia. So always listening for, you know, lung sounds. Uh, are they running a temperature? But remember, the older adult, for a lot of times, their white count may not go up. They may not run a temperature. They present very different. So, you know, you have to look at a lot of things. And do they need oxygen? You know, that might be what they need. So we always have oxygen available. Uh, cellulitis, uh, that needs a good assessment. You know, you can scratch yourself and it heals. And you can scratch yourself a small scratch and all of a sudden it's red and inflamed. So cellulitis is just an infection in the tissues. Um, usually you do need an antibiotic. Um, and it's bad if you're diabetic, you could lose a foot or a toe. Um, or it could just spread. So I'm um, always looking and it makes it a little hard because a lot of our patients have peripheral vascular disease, the circulation and maybe their lower legs isn't good or peripheral arterial disease. So um, their legs are already gonna have chronic color changes to them. Their legs are always gonna be cold. Uh, so is it really an infection or is this just part of what they've got? So I've got to kind of do a real good assessment and figure out what they need. Um, Allergies to meds, we go always looking at medications. Fall, safety precautions. Um, you know, you can only do so much sometimes. Um, constantly telling family members they're going to fall at some point, especially if someone really wants to be up and walking. You know, we're not going to restrain them. We're not going to do that. We're going to watch them closely. We're going to try to keep them still. But uh, most of the people I've seen that want to walk are going to try to walk. So um, it's just keeping them in as safe an environment as you can. Um, a lot of people at some point with dementia will quit walking. We don't know if it's fear of falling or if they forget how to walk or what, but I've got quite a few that are gonna walk till they fall and break something. So, um, you know, it's just constant monitoring. Agitation, um, you know, we talked a little bit about this. Have there been any changes in the environment? Are they in pain? Urinary tract infections, we get a lot of them, a lot in women. Uh, men, their prostates get bigger. Um, lots of times they can't completely empty their bladder. Um, they get very restless. So we'll do a bladder scan or cath them and get a lot of urine out. So, you know, that's a problem. Um, I'm constantly, constantly often checking lab. Are their electrolytes out of whack because they're not drinking enough? Um, their kidney function, their creatinine, their BUN, um, their white count up. Are they anemic? You know, their hemoglobin's low. The hemoglobin, hemoglobin carries the oxygen to the brain. So if your hemoglobin's low, you're not getting as much carried to the brain. So <clears throat> constantly checking that. Um, uh, go to the next one. I'm talking too fast. I talk so fast. Okay. So some prevention strategies. Uh, let's go to depression first. Again, um, first, are they depressed? Want some ways to look at it. Are they coming out for meals? Are they staying in their rooms? Do they not want to do any activities? 
But you got to think, if grandma never liked flower arranging, she may not come out for flower arranging. Um, but then you play the hymns, the old hymns, and she's out for everything. So we try real hard to see what they like to do and try to continue to let them do that. Um, so cardi and make sure they're taking their medications. Are they taking their meds for cardiac? Uh, I'm always assessing for early heart failure changes, increased weight, a wet cough, edema. Um, we get a lot of heart failure in, and these people are, are delicate. So it's a constant balancing act. You know, what do they weigh? Are they wet sounding? You know, so uh, adjusting meds. Um, <clears throat> the COPD, now a lot of them won't use their inhalers. They won't leave the oxygen on if they need it. You try to puff the inhaler in. So that's a challenge. Um, trying to keep them free from infections important because they're going to get whatever comes along. Um, talked about arthritis, osteoporosis, exercise. We do have physical therapy, occupational therapy, getting them moving, walking. Now, I'll tell you this, a lot of families get very upset when their loved one puts walking and they insist on more and more physical therapy where you should make him walk. He needs to get up. A lot of times when, when people with dementia quit walking, it's because they're afraid of falling and they know they're unsteady on their feet. Some are in their brain, they know. So, uh, you know, it's a lot of talking to the families. I know this is hard. I know you want to see them walking, but we're at the point where if they walk, they're probably going to fall. We do try physical therapy to get them stronger, and it works a lot of times. It gets them stronger. They help with the balance. They work with a lot of different things, and it's great. But, you know, at some point, you have to kind of think, you know, they're not going to do it. And do they hurt? You know, horrible, horrible arthritis in their knees. It just hurts to walk. Um, kidney disease, uh, again, lab checks. Um, you know, we don't usually have people on dialysis with this disease. I do have a couple in other facilities. Uh, the family's insisting on it. So, you know, keeping them still, it, it's a challenge. And then we talked a little bit about psychiatric conditions, um, calm environment. You know, with COVID, everything's changed. They see us in our gowns, our masks. You know, they're not sure what's going on. So, um, you know, everyone's doing the best they can is all I can say in all the facilities I go to. But um, there is an amount of stress because everyone is more stressed out. Putting all that PPE on is hot. It's stressful. Taking it off, putting it on. Um, and then um, the testing required. So um, a lot of that can set our residents off and they know when we're stressed. I remember when 9-11 um, happened, you know, of course we turned the TVs off, but some places had their own TVs and they kept thinking the planes, more planes were going into towers. We had people just, and we were all stressed. So it was not a good situation at that time. Okay, so treatments, we, we, we kind of touched on all this. Frequent assessment for changes in overall behaviors. I get lab as indicated. You know, the, the urinalysis are a little bit tricky just because uh, they're more agitated or something. Everyone immediately says, check a urine. And yeah, that's appropriate. But, you know, that's not always the case. And then where family members can get upset is where they're like, well, they, they have a urinary tract infection. Why aren't you putting them on a medication? So what happens, just so you all know, we get the initial urine back. And if it's positive in certain things like leukocytes, nitrates, WBCs, things like that, we know what's what we call a dirty urine. They probably are got, there's a good chance they have an infection. Or it could be contamination. How well were they clean? Were they straight cast? Were they put on a toilet? How well were they clean? We have to wait 48 to 72 hours to get the culture and sensitivity back. And what that, what that is, is they culture the bacteria to see what it's sensitive to. So we know what antibiotic to put them on. So putting them on a daily antibiotic, it may not be the right one, could be, might not be. So they're getting all this antibiotic in their system that um, it's not gonna do anything because say it's uh, sensitive to Bactrim and they're on uh, macrodan, it's not gonna fix it. So we're not big on the daily antibiotic. I have several people on it and 
we do it and it might be working. I don't know, but um, I just don't want a lot of antibiotics in their systems. And then if they have something else, we have to start another one for what they're actually sensitive to. So now they've got more antibiotics in their system. Um, be sure actually taking the medications. Lots of times they're pocket them like that. They're spitting, spit them out. Uh, when they start doing that, I always check to make sure if they have a swallow problem. Have they had a, maybe a little stroke? You know, what's going on? What we do see with people with this disease is for some reason, they seem to forget how to swallow as the disease gets more progressive. And it could be that part of their brain that is now not working right. So if they're pocketing food, if they're not chewing it up, if they're spitting it out, you know, we have to decide, are we going to do a swallow eval? which I'm on the fence about because then you've kind of got your recommendations, maybe Pureed, which most of them don't like. Uh, at some places, families can sign a waiver for them to keep eating what they want because that's what they enjoy, knowing they're probably going to choke. Um, so you got to kind of figure out what to do. Uh, the other thing with the medications, I go through and see what they need the most. Now, we can crush a lot of them up, put them in pudding, applesauce, some you can't crush, the extended release, some you can't. Um, but I try to figure out what's most important for this person. Get rid of the vitamins, get rid of a lot of different things, but they really need that heart failure pill. You know, So that's what I do is get rid of as much as I can and keep them on what they need. I can switch it to liquid. If they can swallow liquids, I'm always looking what can I change it to that they're tolerate. Um, at some point when they're very late stage, we usually take them off all their medications. And we'll talk a little bit about when to stop the um, Alzheimer's medications. Uh, pain again, that's a big one with me. I don't want anyone hurting if I can help it. That's a priority for me. And again, like we said, decrease as many medications as possible to reduce med-med interactions. Okay, and at what stage do they really need that medication? Okay, so for your Aricept, Namenda, Exelon, and Galanamine, which I don't see very much, um, when do you stop it? That's a great question. Um, what I look at and I talk to the families, um, do they still know you? Do, are they still responding? Are they able to feed themselves? If they're doing anything at all, cognitively, functionally, I tend to leave them on them. Okay. Now, um, if they're not and they really decline, those medications, and they all have a little bit of a different indication, some more mild, some more moderate, um, I take them off. They're not really not doing any good. Because if you look at what they do for the Aricept, Exelon, and Galanamine, what they're doing is they are increasing a chemical neurotransmitter in the brain called acetylcholine. And what acetylcholine does is this nerve cell is trying to talk to this nerve cells, it's boosting the amount of that neurotransmitter so the connection can be made. So you can see when there are so many plaques and tangles that it's not going to get made no matter how much circulating acetylcholine you have, there's no sense of them being on the drug. It's not going to hurt them, but it's not working anymore. So at some point, and the men does, works a little bit different. It works on a little different site, but that's pretty much the same thing that's going on. So usually by moderate, severe, I have most of them off. Uh, some families want them to stay on till the end, which is fine. It's not going to hurt them if they can swallow it. It's not going to hurt them. But um, really, you're not getting, they're not working. So again, it's just me talking with the families and saying, you know, what are they doing? Um, you know, the, the bad part is if you take them off too soon, they don't always get back to where they were. But at that point, they're probably not going to anyway. Okay. Uh, it's never just one thing, okay? Uh, persons with dementia usually just do not only have, we must look at the whole picture. Uh, you know, are they acting this way because they're in pain, because they're in heart failure and they can't breathe? Uh, it might not be just the dementia for the behaviors. So we've got to figure that out. And that's what I'm doing, the docs are doing. We're trying to figure it out. Um, Frequent medication review is very important, especially if coming out of the hospital. In the hospital, they're going to put them on all sorts of things. They're going to change things. That's why so many family members come to me and say, please, Barb, don't send mom to the hospital, no matter what. And that's fine. Some facilities will agree to that. Um, 
So you have to talk to your facility. I just had one that told me, said it was a horrible experience. They're not used to dealing with people with dementia. Mom broke her hip, kept trying to get out of bed. Um, I hear this all the time. Um, you know, so it's, it depends on what it is and what the facility says they have to go or they don't have to go. Your better facilities will give me and the docs time to try to figure out if we can keep them there and how to keep them comfortable. Um, so if they're coming out of the hospital, I'm really looking at those medications. Uh, when they first come and you admission, I'll say, well, why are they on this? Well, I don't know. She's never had that disease. Well, probably at some point she did, but does she still need it? So we'll do a trial of taking maybe them off something, especially like your H2 blockers, PPIs, your, your uh, Pepsid and those. They go in the hospital, everyone gets put on them. But do they really have reflux? Do they need them? Um, come on, all sorts of things. And I just go through that list and make notes, check marks, and then call the family. And we try to get them off as many as we can. Um, talk with families. They know what medications their loved ones have been on and, and their question changes. And always look for sub subtle signs. Something is not the same or it's not right. Um, I've learned not to ignore that in kind of the hard way sometimes. Um, with this disease, there's so many changes, it's hard to know. But if a family member says to me, Barb, she's never done this before, she just doesn't seem right, I'm on it. I'm going to try to figure it out. And it, you know, sometimes I have to say it's progression of the disease state. We can't find anything in her lab and her medications. Um, but um, I'm always going to be looking to see if there's something else we can do. Um, so again, talking with the families to me is very important. Uh, and I think education of the families, these lunch and learns are great. I do a lot of different talks because I think the more everyone understands the disease process, I don't want to say it'll make it easier for them, but they understand the changes they see sometimes and that, you know, we're doing the best we can to keep their loved one on an even kill, you know, as good as we can get them. Uh, but there will be changes. It is progressive and it is terminal. And we do at our at UNT, we do the formal neuropsychological testing, and this is usually people in the earlier stages, and we have neuropsychologists there, and it's a whole battery of tests, two to three hours, and it looks at every part of the brain. They do these tests, and they get a diagnosis, and I've had families, I've had patients say to me, I thought I was going crazy. I I'm so, this is so horrible. I have this, but at least I know why I'm forgetting words, why I'm doing what I'm doing. I have a disease. Um, and then, you know, hook them up with the Alzheimer's Association, start working with them, get your financial affairs in order, get your living will in order, you know, a lot of things. We have social workers there that immediately step in and uh, we push hard to get, have them get things in order and not to wait, especially if they're still cognitively intact pretty much and they can make their own decisions because at some point that is going to be taken away from them, okay? Okay, so we talked a lot about depression. Uh, we talked about when to stop the medications and how long they're effective and when to stop them. And I think that's it. We're open for questions. Do you have anything else? I'm, I talk so fast. I just, I'm just used to talking fast. Let me stop sharing. Okay, so at this point, if anybody has any questions, you can put it in the chat or you can just unmute yourself and ask. I'll watch for the chat and I can open yep. it. Or if you have a specific topic you'd like Barb to speak just a little bit more mm -hmm. to, you can put that in there as well. I know I talk very fast, I'm always moving. Anything at all? Yeah, I would like to ask a question. Um, so my husband was recently diagnosed with Parkinson's on top of Alzheimer's. And um, so since then, in the last week and a half, there's been so much agitation and he seems to be angry a lot at me for any just stuff. Um, there's so much stuff going on that's different. And I'm assuming that's maybe part of the Parkinson's. I don't, I don't know. He wasn't angry before, but last night when I was getting ready for bed and I was in the bathroom, I, he was in his recliner in the den. I thought the doorbell rang 
and it was him. He had gone outside through the garage and knew and remembered enough to at least come ring the doorbell. And this is about 1130 at night. So that's my first instance of him leaving, but he didn't go anywhere, he, but he got out of the house. Mm -hmm. So. Um, what to do? Yeah, kind of what to do. Yeah, I was yeah. upset last night. I mean, I'm going to, you know, is it is it time for alarms? Are there better things to do? Um, yeah, I'm sorry. It's hard. You're getting a double whammy here. And it could be both. Yeah, mm -hmm. honestly, Parkinson's and can have uh, a lot of behavioral issues too. Um, there's a frustration and everything. Uh, my suggestion for your peace of mind is to get some type of safety lock so he can't get out. You know, something safe for you too, so you can get out if you need to. But yeah, you're going to have to do something because he's going to get out and not remember where he's at. And there's a good chance he could wander off or go to a neighbor's house and they might shoot him. I mean, you know, these things have happened. Right. So right. I would definitely um, and uh, be sure his primary care provider knows about this. Um, he may need to have some medication adjustments. You may need something that besides behavioral altercations, which might be hard to do, he's still at home, he's still in a familiar place. Um, but he may need some medication adjustments to maybe just to take the edge off of that agitation, especially if it's new. Is there something else going on? So I would call his primary care provider and let him know he's more agitated. He wandered out last night and, you know, see if, if you know, is there a medication? And I don't mean you're trying to zonk him. I'm not saying that, but you can take the edge off with some of the medications. Okay. Keep him yeah. Calm. And I, I do want to find somebody at, at, at UNT. I think he needs to move to a more specialized doctor. Mm -hmm. So I need to, I need to do that. I need to figure that out. I think it'd be better for him to have mm -hmm. somebody that's more in, engaged in that area. If anyone's interested, uh, give a plug. We are, we are taking new patients. I don't, I don't know the waiting list. I don't do clinic. I just do long-term care, but you would call 817- 735-2200 and uh, say first available physician because again, and we have nurse practitioners that have been there a long time and we all do the same intake and just uh, say, you know, my husband's diagnosed with Alzheimer's and with Parkinson's and I, I would like to get a, a new primary care physician or someone better versed in these areas. But okay. I definitely get some type of, type of safety lock on the door. Something. Yes. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Concerns? And again, someone chatted in. Uh, my name's Barbara Hardy, H-A-R-T-Y. I'm a nurse practitioner at UNT. And we have, again, physicians, nurse practitioners. Our clinic also has a uh, uh, physical therapist, neuropsychologist. Uh, we're really geared to address the needs of the older adult. Uh, we get healthy adults too, but we kind of specialize in uh, the dementia. That's why we have the neuropsychologists there. Anything else? Did we cover everything about the medications, depression, acute versus chronic. Um, and you know, there is help out there. I would tell you all to, um, to chat on. Let me see what I tell you all to keep in touch with your um, keep in touch with your uh, primary care provider, and you know don't be afraid to ask for a referral. Uh, this disease is very complicated, and what we found out is a lot of the primary care providers um, it's and it's time consuming. The the testing and the behaviors, and a lot of them they. I'm not saying they don't know what to do, but it's a time consuming disease. And most of them are not adverse to you seeing someone that is kind of working with more people with the disease. Anything else? Okay. So before we would call the number you gave, <clears throat> we would need to get a referral from my husband's regular primary care or did I, I misunderstand? I think you do. I would, it depends on your insurance. 
And what we've had some people do, and again, I don't do clinics, I'm not sure how this works. They keep their primary care provider and we're the specialists for their dementia. Now, I have heard them talk about that, but um, um, I don't know if you need a referral. I just call the number and whoever you get and you might get put on hold. They've been very busy, but uh, leave your name and everything. Um, they can tell you, you'll get someone that can tell you exactly what you need to do. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Okay, well, thank everybody. And again, don't feel alone. There's help out there. It's a horrible disease and there's a lot of research going on trying to crack it. Oh, I will just say this about, if you hear about the new drug, should I say anything? Okay, it is for adenomanacab, Adelon is what we're calling it. It's one of what we call the MAB drugs, which are monoclonal antibodies. And these are man-made antibodies. And you're hearing more about it with COVID. Uh, we've done some testing on them with different companies and they haven't proven beneficial with the testing we've done. And these have been uh, what we call phase three trials, which are really big trials worldwide. Phase one is just a um, small group of people, even without the disease, to see how the drug's gonna work in the human body. And then you have phase two, which is a larger group of people with the disease. And phase three is usually worldwide, lots of people with the disease, and what we do as clinical research coordinators is, uh, is it working? This could be for hypertension, diabetes, whatever. Is it working? Um, how is it going with other medications? Are there any drug-drug interactions? How are people doing? If anyone has any type of an ad serious adverse event, they're hospitalized or whatever, they fall, they have to let me, if they're doing the study through UNT, know, and I have to do all these reports. So say you get a hundred reports from all over the world that people with this disease are falling down or they're, they're breaking their arm spontaneously. The drug company, be it Pfizer, Roche, Eli Lilly, they need to know this. So they're constantly putting data in how many people are having these adverse events. So is this drug safe or not? Okay, do we even wanna go any further? Okay, so that's kind of a background of how a drug makes it to market and phase four is marketing of the drug. So. With this new drug, Adelon, um, there are lots of questions about it. Um, you know, uh, does it work? You know, the cost, 56000 a year, an IV infusion every month. How long do you need it? Uh, how much of the plaque is it clearing away? Uh, you have your adverse events, which are two types. You have your edema of the brain and you have your hemorrhage of the brain. Um, and you expect that because what it's doing, it's clearing those amyloid plaques out of the brain is as it clears them, it's pulling them out. So you're gonna have a little bit of bleeding. Now, how serious is it? A lot of people, not at all. But what, if we were to give the drug, we'd have to do is do a lot of different scans and what the drug company is saying, like at dose seven, I think it's dose seven and 12, I'd have to go back and look, um, scans to see, you know, um, so there's just a lot of questions about it. Uh, we are, we've had three meetings with their drug reps, with their pharmacist, uh, the drug company putting it out. <clears throat> who's putting it out? I can't even remember. <coughs> I can't even remember who's putting it out. Um, we got another one coming out because we've had a lot of questions, okay? So right now it's an IV infusion once a month. Uh, scans are required. We don't know yet if insurance is going to cover it. It's just for mild cognitive impairment. And if you see that term MCI, what that means is um, people that haven't been diagnosed with any type of dementia, but they have more memory loss than someone in their age group should have. So it's someone we watch. Some of them will stay the same. Some of them will get do better. Some of them will go on to a type of dementia. So it's a real hard to tell. Um, so it's... Uh, Indicated for MCI, mild cognitive impairment, are the very early stages of dementia. And we don't know how long someone would have to stay on it or how long. Um, and then the scans and everything else. So there's still a lot of questions about it. At our university, we haven't quite agreed to do it yet. We're still collecting a lot of information, a lot of data, and we're having meetings with the drug company, the pharmacists, the, the drug reps, the everybody so we can kind of set it in place. You also ahead of time, they want you to have a lumbar puncture. 
to look for the uh, amyloid. We're trying to see if we can just do the PET scan. Um, so, you know, there's a lot to do just to get into the study. So, uh, not the study, it's not a study, it's approved, it's FDA approved. So um, if you hear about it, just talk to your doctor about it. If you have questions, uh, you can, Holly can get a hold of me because I'm kind of involved in, in with the group, group of us that are looking at, are we comfortable with, with giving this medication? So, and, and you take about two three minutes when you have that COVID and dementia. Oh, COVID and dementia. Okay, Holly's getting yes, after we've me. We've got about six minutes, but we'll just address. Yeah, okay. COVID. She wanted me to do it just a few minutes here on COVID and dementia. So what we're looking at, again, uh, well, you know, we're all at risk. We're all doing what we need to do. Uh, we're trying to get everyone in our long-term care facilities vaccinated. Um, that's staff included. I know there's a lot of controversy and everything. But right now, if you just kind of look at the, um, <clears throat> the benefit for the people, <clears throat> especially with dementia, uh, we're really encouraging it. And for staff and visitors, which we can't really ask, I don't think, or not, we can't ask. So if we're all vaccinated and all your loved ones are vaccinated, and then we have visitors that come in that aren't, you know, that could be how it could get transmitted. Now we're seeing breakthrough, which is expected. With any virus you have in any vaccination, there's gonna be some breakthrough. And I know a lot of people are using that to say, we shouldn't get it. There's, you know, people are still getting it. There's always gonna be breakthrough. Um, but the thing is, if people do get it um, after they've been vaccinated, what we're seeing, it's much milder. It's not requiring hospitalization. So what a lot of people are thinking, and again, it's new, and that's what I'm having to tell people. It's new. It's like polio, smallpox, mumps, shingles. When it's new, they're trying to figure it out, what's going to work. And then people say, well, they got the vaccine out too soon. And I'm like, we've got the technology now, and they've been working on coronaviruses for years. This is not something that they've never seen before. COVID is, but coronaviruses, the group it's in. So um, that doesn't worry me. Uh, Long-term effects, uh, you're going to hear the long haulers that are having the problems that, you know, have gotten it and now they're having shortness of breath, they're having heart issues, they're having nerve pain. So, and how long that's going to last? I was in a seminar on that just the other day and they're not sure how long it's going to last. Um, so um, our goal in all of my facilities is to take politics out of it is to try to get everyone vaccinated. Um, it's the, the most we can do, the best we can do. We know the vaccine works. <clears throat> um, we know you can still have breakthrough. We know you can still get it, but hopefully you won't get as sick. So if you've got COVID and dementia, you know, we can't have these people isolate themselves. A lot of them won't wear a mask. A lot of them are in each other's faces and in their rooms. So, you know, all the facilities I go to usually have a quarantine area where they're putting anyone that tests positive. You know, they're doing the best they can to keep them separate. But COVID and dementia is hard because we can't keep masks on them. We can't keep them out of each other's rooms. We can't. So the best we can do is try to keep them as safe as we can um, in a safe environment we can. And then... Um, you know, families have to make some tough decisions then, you know, do they want to send them to the hospital? Um, you know, they're going to, end, some of them would probably end up on a ventilator. Do you want to do that? Um, so a lot of tough decisions with COVID and dementia. Um, our best bet is to, to, in every facility I go to, is to keep them as safe as we can and away from anyone who even has the potential to bring it in the building. Um, because it's, I'm telling you, where I go, it, it can spread like wildfire. You have one person with it, and all of a sudden you've got four or five, even if everyone's taking precautions. So we're doing, we're just doing the best we can, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Questions on COVID? Okay. All right. Well, we appreciate everybody being on today. We will send out the recording and the slides. And... If you're needing a CEU, we will also send you information so that you can take the uh, Survey Monkey and we'll send you your CEU. All right, everybody, thank you. Bye.